I'm Miriam. I'm from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I'm a second year in On God Meta's lab. Um, we are a brand new collaborator to this project, and we're super excited. Uh, we are looking at transforming the minimal cell into a synthetic organelle through endosymbiosis. Um, for this presentation, we only recently got the minimal cell, so what I'm going to show you is our established platform that we plan on applying to the minimal cell for endosymbiosis and um, explain how exactly we plan to do that. Um, my screen is not, oh, there it goes, sorry. Um, so for those who may not be aware, um, eukaryotic organelles are theorized to evolve from free living bacteria, which were uptaken by an ancestral archaeal cell, which um, then essentially assimilated that bacteria into an organelle through a series of genome reducing events um, and um, establishing a relationship that allows the host cell to provide something to the um, endosymbiont and the endosymbiont to provide something back to the host cell. Uh, so we have a minimal scientific understanding overall of how this transformation actually occurred. And it's one of the main unknowns in the evolution of life. Um, so a key feature that we will be focusing on is the loss of non-essential genes and transfer to the host nucleus, um, thereby having a organelle with a minimal genome. And specifically, we look at the mitochondria and chloroplasts of cells because those are organelles with their own genomes, um, which is why our lab at the moment currently focuses on cyanobacteria themselves at, for creating artificial plant cells. Um, so earlier this year, our lab published a paper on engineering artificial photosynthetic life forms through endosymbiosis. Um, Dr. Yang Li Gao is also on at this workshop. Um, he is one of the authors of the paper, and I'm going to go briefly over how we our platform for that, as well as the results we got, and then how that applies to the minimal cell. Um, so over in schematic A, you'll just see the uh, basic theory behind this, which is your ancestral host cell uptakes your cyanobacteria or your aerobic bacteria and assimilates that into the modern cell. Obviously, we're missing a lot of steps in between. It doesn't just take up the cell and then suddenly it's a mitochondria or chloroplast. Um, what we're specifically looking at um, is making sure that our, for our platform can grow on non-fermentable carbon sources like glycerol, which is how we know the cell or the endosymbiont was successfully incorporated. Um, which is schematic B. So normally cells with functional mitochondria can grow on glucose. Um, what our lab does is we create yeast mutations with non-functional mitochondria or, mito or major mitochondrial defects that make it so they can't grow in the absence of glucose. And then we input the um, endosymbiont through PEG-induced fusion and see if we get recovered growth. Um, the way we do that is by genetically modifying cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria have neutral sites that you can use for recombination, um, sort of like we're going to be using the landing pad in the minimal cell, where we can input genes and then transfer that gene into the cell and then use that modified cell as our endosymbiont. Um, and the data I'll be showing you today, we actually inserted an ATP translocase gene into our cyanobacteria, which don't normally translocase ATP out of their own cell because that tends to not be beneficial for them. Um, so over at the right side of schematic D, um, you kind of have what our final product is supposed to be, where we have a cell that a host cell that cannot grow grow on glu well that cannot grow in the absence of glucose is on a glycerol carbon source and relies on the cyanobacteria as its mitochondria to provide ATP. Um, I will note that we do grow these cells on um, rich media, so we are specifically looking at the recovered ATP um, related growth and not anything else at the moment. Um, so yeah, uh, so what I want to show here is that we have successfully managed to incorporate translocase into our cyanobacteria, and we do have an established method for measuring that. Um, in this schematic, Synjec-1 is the strain of cyanobacteria. Um, what we have is you incubate it with ADP, so part of the translocase is that it uptakes ADP and exports ATP, which is what we're measuring. Um, so our plan is to insert that gene into the minimal cell and use the same method to measure whether or not we can first establish ATP translocase. Um, part of the way we verify all this is through um, 
imaging and gDNA. So um, schematic A just shows the difference between um, rounds of growth. So round three is on selective media, which does not contain glucose. Um, and what we can see the difference between round three and round four as the, glu as the glucose is removed and you're left to just grow on glycerol, the yeast control, which cannot metabolize glycerol by itself, slowly dies out and our um, JEC3 and JEC2 and JEC4 cyanobacteria mutants, which can provide ATP to the host cell, maintain their growth. We do also verify this through uh, gDNA. Um, so what you have in schematic B is a, the PCR results of a gDNA extraction. MAT A is a, um, is a yeast mating gene that is present in all yeast. So that should be in every sample from the yeast control to the end of symbionts. Um, the bottom one is a chloramphenicol resistance marker that has been programmed into the cyanobacteria cells themselves and should not be in yeast, which is not naturally resistant to chloramphenicol. Um, so what we see here is we are able to selectively, selectively put in the cyanobacteria cells. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see growth curves um, that just show you the difference between cyanobacteria, uh, cyanobacteria containing samples and the yeast only control, which is supposed to die off. Um, again, this is on selection media, so you can see that in the first figure, there is a huge difference between the yeast only control and the cyanobacteria um, samples. Um, you're probably wondering what the results in the huge difference of growth from the cyanobacteria samples themselves. Um, and what it is is that the JEC3 sample has snares incorporated into it to help stabilize the cell in inside the other cell. Um, so JEC2, JEC3, and JEC4 just have a few differences where some have snares, some don't have snares. They all do have ATP translocase, so you can see that all do have recovered growth to some extent compared to the control. Um, we also verify all of this through imaging, uh, microscopy imaging. Uh, cyanobacteria themselves are naturally fluorescent, and we um, are planning on using uh, the minimal cell that I believe has M cherry encoded in it to also um, show these results as well. Uh, so what we can show through turf imaging and uh, confocal microscopy, when you overlay the images of the signal given off by yeast, which should be none, to the signal given off by cyanobacteria is localized cyanobacteria in cells, which is pretty cool, which also helps support our previous um, data that the cyanobacteria is actually incorporated in the cell. Um, the cyanobacteria themselves cannot grow on our selection media, so in order for this to work, they do have to be in the cell. Um, we also have transmission electron microscopy images where you can see the um, cyanobacteria it structure itself inside the yeast cell. Um, the minimal cell is similar in size to cyanobacteria, so we are looking forward to that being easily put into the cell through our um, fusion method, um, which brings me to our investigation to the engineering the minimal cell itself. Um, so we, our main goal is can we engineer these minimal cells as endosymbionts within the yeast, which I've shown data that we can do with what is thought to be the precursor of mitochondria and chloroplasts. And um, our first step is going to be to engineer the endosymbiosis itself between GCVI and respiratory deficient yeast cells. Um, the two ways we plan on doing that is first our established ATP translocase method where we input an ATP translocating gene into the minimal cell itself. And the other is um, which data, which the data was not shown, is also to make a glucose secreting version that could provide a glucose source that the um, yeast, the, the mitochondrial deficient yeast cell could still um, metabolize. And ultimately the goal is, um, I know that Dr. Gloss's lab is intending to put in a second landing site into the minimal cell. So hopefully we'll be able to have both genes in the minimal cell. And we've been able to show that there is um, a substantial growth difference between the endosymbionts with just the one gene and the endosymbiont with the two gene with our cyanobacteria. Um, and we're investigating based on the evolu evolutionary premise of little, limited metabolic coupling and further genome minimization, um, which would be really cool because the minimal cell itself is already a, a minimal genome. Um, but the whole point of endosymbiosis is that the endosymbiont itself also benefits from the host. So there is a chance we could further minimize the endosymbiont, i.e. the minimal host cell, to create a better model where we have the most minimal gene 
for a mitochondrial chloroplast like um, synthetic organelle. Um, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my lab, Dr. John Glass, for inviting us to this. And um, again, Dr. Yang Li Gao, who is on this call, and Jason Krenoyer, who is the main author of the paper mentioned previous. And um, I would like to open this to questions. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Very nice, Miriam. So you're officially you know, now a speaker at an international meeting. Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> um, I, I, I still, you know, concerns with this are that the, the metabolism of the mycoplasma, these minimal cells, and the metabolism, the metabolic rates of the cyanobacteria may be radically different. Any mm -hmm. thoughts about that and, and how that might affect things? Um, from what I understand, I actually think, I believe the minimal cell grows slightly faster than the okay. cyanobacteria. Um, mm -hmm. My cyanobacteria that I use, um, usually to achieve like decent doubling, you kind of wait about like 48 to 72 hours, um, which unless I'm misunderstanding, the minimal cell does grow faster, correct? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually think it would be better because I think we um, sort of run into the problem where the yeast kind of outgrow the cyanobacteria, mm -hmm. um, which then we end up getting less endosymbionts. Um, than we really want. Uh, so I think actually the minimal cell is a better candidate. Um, I think the only difference is uh, the photosynthetic capabilities of the minimal cell. So with the cyanobacteria, it's pretty easy to maintain because all you need is um, the proper light source. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the minimal cell, we will have to, I believe, feed it in a sense. Um, so I think that is where the complication lies. Sure. So I guess yeast divides every 90 minutes or so, or maybe the respiratory deficient yeast divides a lot slower? Yeah, they, the respiratory deficient yeast definitely um, divide a, a bit slower. Uh, right now, we are um, working on minimizing background growth for some of our respiratory yeast strains, which did just unfortunately show uh, more recovered growth than we would have liked. So that I think will also influence um, how things go, depending on like how drastically um, our method of reducing that background might affect the minimal cell itself. Um, but I think proportionally the yeast growth for our yeast defective or for mitochondria defective yeast cells isn't too different from the normal yeast itself. And then the minimal cell ought to divide, say, maybe a little slower than every two hours, depending on how many genes you add to it. Yeah. I mean, I, that, I think that's still better than... Um, or faster than my cyanobacteria, which are, is basically a, a fast growing cyanobacteria strain every four hours. And then I assume you've seen Bogomil Karras's paper. Bogomil is on the call on the on on the meeting today, showing how he fused how he fused um, the mycoplasma cells with yeast cells. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean. Um, we did a peg-induced fusion, which mm -hmm. has that's, been shown that's to what, work That's counters. what Bogomil did, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. we spiroplast the yeast cells, and then we do peg-induced fusion, and it's about a seven-hour, eight-hour process all said and done. You might look at Bogomil's papers. It, it may be helpful to see some details he worked out just that were more appropriate for mycoplasmas. I see Bogomil just yeah. turned his camera on. And <laughs> yes, I, I had to. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for mentioning this. Yeah, so we definitely had great interest of this project and we actually wanted to do this in Canada, but unfortunately we cannot work with that strain. So at least the research is going forward. So one thing that, that you know, I noticed, and I guess the some of the genes in the wild type strains, especially the GPLF facilitator protein, when you remove the cell fusion works so much better. Um, so I wonder if you considering at all to work with the wild type strain of mycoplasma, maybe with like just few knockouts, because from the point of cell fusing, some of them were much better, I think, than the minimal cell. Uh, but again, obviously you won't have all the understanding. So I just wonder if if the effort is just focused now on the minimal cell. Um, we were given a bunch of different strains, and I believe the wild type was included yes. in there. Um, 
and our lab tends to be pretty adamant about like testing everything. So I'm yeah. I'm sure we're that's our goal is to try it with every strain we have and see what works best and go from there, which is kind of yeah. what we've been doing with the cyanobacteria. And I, I guess, you know, one more thing, because when we start trying to look at this, it is very hard to see this tiny mycoplasma inside yeast. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if you have some powerful microscopy or how you're going to overcome the, you know, when you kind of show vis visualization of some of the other cells, it's easier, like, back, you know, E. coli or cyanobacteria. But with mycoplasma, maybe a bit tough to see it inside. I think well, I think they've got the world's best microscopes available to them, so. Okay. This is this is something new for Illinois. Yes. All right. No. So that's really great. And you know, pot potentially maybe we could we could talk more offline because we are doing with some other molecules the same project. So we could maybe chat about this a little bit more. Yeah, of course. Um, my PI unfortunately is taking a course right now, so he is not in this meeting. But I will definitely let him know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.